much and good morning everyone and welcome to the first session for today. Uh, I'm Tom White from the Australian National University in Canberra uh, and I'll be chairing this session. So we have three 30 minute invited talks uh, in this uh, this morning's session. Uh, for the speakers, uh, I'll send you a private chat message of when you have 10 minutes remaining. Um, and can I also remind the audience uh, that you can post questions via chat at any time uh, during the presentation and these will uh, be answered at the end of the talk. So with that, uh, I'd like to welcome our first speaker of the session, Professor Martin de Sterke from the University of Sydney, Australia. And the title of Martin's talk is A Menagerie of Solitons by Variation of the Dispersion. Thank you, Martin. All right, thanks, Tom. So let me share my screen. Uh, where is it? Oops. Workshop. Sorry, people. Um, hmm. I'm just turning some show windows. Ah, I've took too many windows open, I'm sorry. All right, and I will. Okay. Good. Are we good to go? Can you see it? Yes, we can see that. Oh, we okay, can see good. your. It's, we can see the. It's in presentation mode. What we're seeing at the moment, or the presenter oh, mode. Right, and I don't know. Ah, how do I change that? Let me see. Uh, if you go. No. Nope. The three yep. dots. The three dots, uh, Martin. Yeah. 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 And then I presenter view. Good. Yeah. That's right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I have lectured a mere 50 lectures with um, Zoom and I still don't have it down. Um, anyway, thanks very much for coming everybody. Um, and it's and thank you to, for, to the organizers to inviting me to speak here. It really is a very nice conference and I enjoyed the, um, the presentations yesterday. So let me now talk about the work that uh, my colleagues and I have been um, uh, busy with over the last several years. And, and it really is um, about solitons in which we vary the dispersion. Um, let me first tell you a little bit about the, the environment in which I work. So I'm in the School of Physics at the University of Sydney, but I'm also a member of IPOS, which is the organization of all optics researchers at the, in the university. Um, drawn from physics, chemistry, and electrical engineering. And without boring you with all the details, just have a look at the variety of topics that we work on, all the way from microwave photonics, biophotonics, to astronomical instruments. Some of my colleagues um, go on top of the Subaru telescope in Hawaii to put their instruments on. It really is a wide variety of topics. And if you're interested, let me know. These are my colleagues on the particular project that I'm working on today, um, talking about today. Um, Joshua and Antoine work in the lab. Andrea and Darren are longtime collaborators now residing in the US. Tristan is a colleague in Sydney. Kevin is a former student now doing a PhD in Germany. And Long is a current PhD student working with uh, my colleagues and me in, in Sydney. All right. Let me start. This is, in fact, the last slide, but I would just like you to take a look at this and tickle your, um, your interest, perhaps, and ask you, if you see a plot like this, what does it remind you of? Now, if I were to see a plot like this, I would think, well, this is something you know, I did in second year, it, the Fraunhofer diffraction pattern of a single slit, sorry, of a double slit. And you may remember the argument and we all have an optics background. So I, I assume you're familiar with this, but um, so this is um, uh, um, um, a convolution of uh, the single slit uh, diffraction pattern, which is in, in this case, a sine X on X with the, sine, the sinusoidal diffraction pattern you get from two slits. Now, the punchline here is that what I'm showing here is some of our pulses. 
So on the horizontal axis in what we're actually doing, in what I'm actually talking about this experiment, this is not a diffraction pattern. This is a pulse shape. And so on the horizontal axis is time and on the vertical axis is intensity. And as we will see, um, I will explain where this, how these pulses arise. And I will hopefully explain to you the, the, the commonality between these nonlinear experiments that we carry out and the good old Fraunhofer diffraction pattern that we all know and love. But let me start with in the, in the beginning. And I'll, I'll start talking about solitons. And as most of you will know, solitons are pulses that propagate without changing shape. And so if you want to represent it, that looks really very dull because nothing happens. And so let me make this a bit more interesting and look under the hood and see how these pulses arise. Now, they, solitons in general in, in an optical context arise from um, the balance of negative dispersion and occur nonlinearity. And let us look at this nonlinearity first, according to which, the, in, let me just put my pointer on, according to which the um, refractive index increases with, um, with intensity. So we have now pulse propagating through a medium. And as you can see, by definition, we have a pulse, the, the uh, intensity is time dependence by this, um, this kernel linearity. That means the refractive index varies with time and therefore the phase it depends on time. And if you have a time dependent phase, by definition, this corresponds to a time dependent frequency because it is the derivative. And what happens then is that the, the, the gradients in this in intensity are such that you generate red frequencies on the leading edge of the pulse and blue frequencies on the trailing edge. So the nonlinearity generates new frequencies. Let's now see what the dispersion does. Now, remember we had negative dispersion. That means that red goes slower than blue. And so these newly generated frequency on the leading edge are slowed down and the newly uh, generated blue frequencies on the trailing edge are, are um, sped up and they're both pushed towards the center of the pulse. And this then forms a stable object, which we call a soliton. So this is the kind of lowest order description of a soliton, the balance between the nonlinearity that generates new frequencies and the dispersion that pushes those frequencies back to the center. Now, you may say, well, this is fairly esoteric. Um, well, perhaps not as much as you think. Solitons are really uh, maybe not everywhere in optics, but in a lot of different places. Uh, so for example, in telecommunications, ultra-fast lasers and then buffers. And this um, result here in, in the center, you can see that this ultra-short pulse has an envelope and this envelope in fact corresponds to a soliton. Okay, now the title of my presentation talked about dispersion. So let's us look at the dispersion in a little bit more detail. Um, the blue curve here is some generic dispersion relation between the wave number beta and the frequency omega. And um, the vertical blue bar here indicates the bandwidth of my laser. And what you conclude from this is that you're not really not interested in this part of the dispersion relation of that part, but just in this part here. And so you have a, a finite range of omega and a finite range of beta. And since you're interested only in this really fairly narrow range of frequencies and wave numbers, you can do locally a Taylor expansion of this dispersion relation with as many terms as you care to keep. So let's look at this dispersion relation. It looks fairly complicated, but in fact, it isn't. The absolute wave number is relevant, so we can drop it. This second term here corresponds to it is a group velocity term, and we're going to move in the frame of this um, that moves at this group velocity, and then that term vanishes as well. Um, and so the lowest order leading term is this quadratic one, and compared to that one, the third and fourth and higher order ones vanish. And so the lowest order, the dispersion relation in the frame in which we move 
can be approximated by a parabola. And remember, beta 2 is negative because we have negative dispersion. And so this is the dispersion relation in this moving frame in this fairly narrow wavelength range. It is a parabola with a negative curvature. And so what this means is that you have an arbitrary linear pulse propagating through this, through this medium. And if you take the Fourier transform of it in space and time, then whatever the pulse is, the Fourier transform lies on this parabola. Now, where does the soliton now fit into this, uh, to, in, into this picture? Well, uh, a soliton is a nonlinear object, as we discussed. And in fact, it lies here. It doesn't uh, coincide it, um, with the linear dispersion relation. It's lifted from it by the nonlinear effect, and that is quantified in this parameter. And in fact, it is a straight line for reasons that don't really matter here. But that is basically the way one can understand solitons in this, in this, in this kind of in Fourier uh, space type way. Again, this here is the linear dispersion relation, all linear waves lie on here. The soliton is lifted away from it because it is a nonlinear object. Okay, let's do look at some experiments. These were experiments that were carried out by my colleague Andrea Blanco Redondo about five years ago in a silicon photonic crystal waveguide that was designed to have slow light. And so she characterized the linear dispersion relation of this, of this photonic crystal waveguide and found that the group index, what that is, I'll tell you in a minute, was about 30 for each wavelength here. That means that the group velocity of the light there is C on 30. So that light is really slowed down and she was interested in that for nonlinear optical experiments, the details of which don't matter. Now, what was interesting and what started this whole thing off was that she calculated from this the quadratic dispersion and she found that it was positive. Um, and in fact, she went even further and found that there was negative quartic fourth order dispersion. Well, what does that mean? Well, since the quadratic dispersion is positive, you would not, it's, it's small but positive, you would not expect solitons. Nonetheless, when she did do the experiments, she did find solitons. So the green curve here is the initial pulse, the blue one is the output, and they are right on top of each other. So that means that in spite of the fact that you have enormous amounts of dispersion is, is the same as the input. So this really reminds you of a soliton, yet it can't be a standard one because beta two is positive. Now, the, 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 the solution to this conundrum is that in fact, it is this fourth order, strong fourth order dispersion, which is negative, that drives the salt. So in that picture that I just developed for you, we now have quartic dispersion. So the, the constant, the linear term disappear. The quadratic term is apparently zero, as we saw. And in fact, the cubic term is zero as well, or very small. So the lowest order quartic term is Sorry, the lowest order term of this Taylor series is this negative quartic term. Now, that looks generically similar to a parabola. It isn't, of course, it isn't a parabola, it's more, more, more angular, but it has the same idea. Uh, it's, it has roughly the same shape. And this soliton, again, as before, dangles off here. It is lifted off the linear dispersion relation by an amount mu, and its, its peak value is around this frequency of omega naught. And this we call a pure quartic soliton. And it is novel because it is something that, uh, that balances the nonlinearity and the quartic dispersion. Oops. Oh, sorry, guys. My My slides are stuck. Hmm. Ah, here we are. Okay, so then you can do some numerical calculations, which we did. So this is a standard soliton that has a hyperbolic secant shape, which looks more, like, more or less like a triangle uh, on a log scale. This is this pure quartic soliton, and it really looks different, even though it has an exponential 
envelope of the tails, it has zero crossings. And if you look at the spectrum, you can see that, well, the, the Fourier transform of a hyperbolic secant is a hyperbolic secant. The Fourier transform of this function, which we only know numerically, um, looks similar as for the sedge, except it has this flat top. Okay. So the differences between these pulses are kind of quite visible here, but they are quite subtle, and we'll get to that later. The big difference though, and one of the reasons we were interested in these pulses is, is the scaling. For a conventional soliton, the energy goes up as one over the pulse length, but for this pure cortex soliton, it goes up as one of the pulse length cubed. In other words, a conventional soliton, you, you make it twice as short, the energy doubles. In our case, for these solitons, you have the pulse length and the energy goes up by factor eight. So that's very good scaling, which is good for lasers, but I won't have time to go into that. What we would like to do is now see these solitons in other platforms, for example, an optical fiber, which is a much easier platform to work with experimentally, but gee, that is very hard. We, we designed a, an, a fiber with dominant cortic dispersion, but fabricating is, is well nigh impossible. Um, the paper is given here. Anybody of you who is interested in this and thinks they can design a photonic crystal fiber that's easy to fabricate with dominant cortic dispersion, please let me know. What we did in the meantime, though, is something different. So this is a, the, an outline of the experiment we did. This is, in essence, a standard fiber laser. There's a gain medium here. It's erbium. There's some isolators. There's some pump diodes. There's an output coupler. There's some fabric pro filter. And there's some polarization control, which, in effect, works as the central absorber. But there is this novel element in here, this spectral pulse shape. What does it do? Well, how it works doesn't really matter, though that is very interesting. Basically, can, it can apply a dispersion, sorry, uh, it can apply a phase that is base, can be programmed, and this phase is, can be an arbitrary function of frequency. And therefore, in a, what the, if you don't think, what does dispersion do? Well, it applies a phase upon propagation. You can mimic the effect of dispersion with this box here by applying the dispersion, by applying the phase that propagating through a pure cord, through a medium with quartic dispersion would give you. And that is indeed what we've done. So schematically, the first thing we need, we program this box, and again, you can buy this commercial, that cancels the native dispersion of this fiber. So we have no net dispersion. And then we apply this pure quartic dispersion to so that on average the soliton or the pulses here see this net quartic dispersion. Now you may say this is not the same as dispersion because it's applied discreetly at this position here, but the soliton averages things out, and so it is approximately has the same effect. So let's see what comes out of this later. This is the result when this, this device is off and you just have the negative quadratic dispersion of the cavity and you see this soliton, which the hyperbolic secant shape. You can see those, those spikes here. They are associated with the fact that uh, the soliton's averaging is not perfect. Then we turn the face mask on and you see the differences are quite subtle. This is now a pure quartic soliton you can see, for example, so these are all spectra, that the spectrum is a little bit flattened, but it is not a particularly convincing result. Uh, by the way, these here are experiments and these are, sorry, um, these are simulations. So these are experiments, these are um, simulations. However, we can do better. We can get the pulse shape out using a frog type geometry and you can see that this pulse here, this is on a linear scale and this is on a uh, logarithmic scale, is basically parabolic. And if you look back, and I forgot to mention that, to some of the results here, oops, you can see that this pure quartic soliton looks parabolic here in the center. And we see the same thing here. 
we don't see the zero crossings because we just have too much noise, regrettably. Okay, now to really convince ourselves that this is a pure quartic soliton, we did this uh, energy scaling. So we check the energy as a function of pulse length. And remember, it's claimed to be proportional to one on the third power of the pulse length. And we find that it fits very well. The curves here are theory, the dots are experiments, and you see they're right on top of each other. And these are these different curves correspond to different values of beta four. So we think we have this pretty well done. We have some other evidence that these are pure cortic solitons, which I have left. Now, how can you generalize this? Well, there's a, one obvious way to do it is to say, well, if fourth order dispersion works, how, how about sixth order or eighth order and 10th order? Uh, because this device that we put in our cavity can presumably mimic any kind of dispersion you want. And indeed, we've done that. And these are the results. This is the spectrum. Here's the time trace. And this is the spectrogram in case you know what it is. If you don't, don't, don't worry about it. And you see, well, the spectra become more and more flattened. Um, but apart from that, they more or less look, look, look the same. So although this is then indeed a, um, a, 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 a sextic, a decic, and a, sorry, an optic and a decic soliton, um, they more or less look the same. So you can ask the question, what else can we do? And here we get to the thing I really wanted to talk about. And that is the combination of quadratic and quartic dispersion, so a hybrid. And let us take positive quadratic dispersion and negative quartic dispersion. Now, we're certainly not the first to look into it. There has been some, was some activity on this in the mid nineties. Uh, by particularly by these two gentlemen, Magnus Carlsen and Anders Hook. And more recently, there was uh, activity on this in New Zealand by um, Victor, sorry, Vladimir Kruklov and John Harvey. Um, but all of them uh, considered a um, dominant beta two with a little bit of beta four. We're flipping this around. We say, well, let's take beta two and beta four both three of the same order of, of magnitude. And then you have a dispersion relation that looks like this. It initially goes up because of the quadratic dispersion, and then it's pushed down because eventually the quartic uh, curve wins out or the quartic term wins out. And now you have a dispersion relation with two local maxima. And by the argument that I, that I um, um, discussed earlier, you might expect a soliton associated with each of these peaks. And indeed, that is the case. So what you now have is that each of these peaks is locally a parabola with negative curvature. A conventional soliton forms at each of them, and they have the same group velocity because the slope of this black curve corresponds to the group velocity. So we have two solitons propagating at the same group velocity. Um, but having different frequencies. Now, if you have two objects traveling together at the same speed, but, but at a different frequency, you might expect that in the time domain, they interfere. And that is indeed what happens. So the pulses we see, and I'll show you some experimental results later, look like this. And this, remember, is, is very similar to the slide I showed you in the, in the beginning. This looks like a Fraunhofer diffraction pattern, where the envelope here is associated with the shape of each of the solitons and this rapidly varying carrier, to use electrical engineering language, is associated with the frequency difference between the two pulses. And in that sense, this is very similar to Fraunhofer diffraction, except in time. So let's do this, show you some experiments now. This is the the red curve here is the dispersion relation. The blue curve here is the, the power spectrum. And then the time domain, uh, in, in time, the pulse looks like this. This is the phase. This is the spectrogram. And again, if you don't know what, how to read those, don't worry. Now, this is for zero beta two. So this is a pure quartic soliton. Now we're turning the quadratic dispersion on. And you get two very gentle bumps here there and there. And you see that uh, if you look at the spectrum, you, you see the spectrum separate into two bumps, one associated with each maximum. 
this in, 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 in the time domain, you can see small oscillations here in the pit, in down here um, 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 arise from the interference between the, these two peaks here. And this, in, uh, this spectrogram shows you the separation of the pulses. It, to me, it always looks a bit like the mitosis of a cell. Now we make the, the quadratic dispersion larger. You now see two nicely separated frequency components illustrate, uh, illustrated here, and you see larger side, larger oscillations. And here you can make them even larger. Here the two pulses are really separated in, in frequency. Uh, this here is a CW component. Don't worry about it, it doesn't do anything. And you can see that in the time domain now, these two pulses have, are interfering, they're coherent objects, and you get a very nice interference pattern, which is again, similar to this Fraunhofer diffraction. So we can just check that this all works. We have done simulations. So the top here is that experiment. The bottom here is the simulation. And you see that they agree very, very well. I should also see, say that I've developed a complete theory of this, which is very, very beautiful, um, but I just don't have time to go into this. So I have an, a, a theory that separates this into a carrier and, a, um, and, a, um, and an envelope. Okay, just to, to, to emphasize the relationship between this and Fraunhofer diffraction. So in Fraunhofer diffraction, we have two slits at a distance delta x. Here we have two solitons, or we have a soliton with two frequency components at delta omega. The diffraction pattern has a sinusoidal pattern with a period that is proportional to one over the, um, the spacing. Here we have a time signal that has a sinusoidal component that is periodic with one over the, that difference in, 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 in frequencies. We have all checked that and that all works. The interesting difference is that in the Fraunhofer diffraction experiment, the shape of the envelope is determined by the shape of the slits, right? Usually we use rectangular slits and therefore the envelope is a sine x on x function. In this case here, the, the shape of the, of the quote unquote slit is a soliton. And so the system um, generates its own slits and the shape is in fact a hyperbolic secant. And so in this nonlinear system, the, the, the slits are formed by the experiment itself and you don't have to, um, you have to, you don't have to impose them. The only thing you impose is the dispersion relation and then they grow from noise. Now, there have been some um, other, has been a bit of other work in this area in particular by a German group um, who had numerical results they had a number of results that were quite curious. And this theory that we developed uh, explains all of this. Um, we have, uh, and this work is currently being reviewed um, and is in, uh, is in a, sorry, is in re um, review. I should say that these experimental results we haven't really published yet. So this is novel results. So in conclusion then, um, at the basic level, solitons can arise from any, um, uh, from the balance of uh, cell phase modulation or the nonlinear effect and even orders of dispersion. Um, we have this laser that allows you to generate any type of dispersion and therefore we can generate all kinds of novel types of solitons. We, I have shown you the pure quartic soliton, um, which has application in lasers. We have, I've shown you these um, spectrally periodic solitons with two frequency components. In fact, we've done experiments where we have uh, superimposed five frequency components and the results are really wild. And I hope that this um, work will, uh, will, will be published soon. Um, I should also say these are great student projects within uh, a, a lot of scope for students to work on uh, and a lot of scope for collaboration. So if you're interested, please let me know. Thank you very much. That's all I wanted to say. And I would like to acknowledge the funding sources for this work. And I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks, everybody.
Thank you, Martin, for a fascinating talk as always. Um, so I haven't seen any questions come through on the chat yet, but uh, I assume some, some will come through soon. I might kick off though. Um, you mentioned uh, the, uh, the cubic uh, scaling of energy for the cortex solitons. Yes. For the uh, higher order ones, do you see similar? What does the energy oh, scaling look like for those? Yes, very good question. Um, let me just go back there. Yes. So for the quartic solitons, it's one on tau cubed. Yep. For the sextic soliton, i.e. with sixth order dispersion, it is one on tau to the fifth. Uh, and with our 10th order soliton, it is one on tau to the ninth. So it goes up very rapidly and we have um, um, uh, verified that experimentally. Um, you can, this is the paper here down, down the bottom. The problem is, and, and that when you go to these higher orders where the scaling really goes up is so, for example, again, for the 10th order one, this is 10 to the ninth, mm -hmm. this prefactor, which is 2.87 here, goes down very, very rapidly. It goes down faster than exponential. And we have a mathematical argument in that paper to, um, to convince ourselves that that is indeed case and it has to do with convergence of power series believe it or not um so where the optimum is in terms of lasers is not clear because yes the scaling is very good but if the prefactor is lousy uh it's not clear but yes. that is something that is yet to be done but thanks that is a very good question okay thank you uh so the question comes through in the chat from alexander uh, i'm not sure if it's going to come up on the screen, but I can read that out. So, uh, oh, there it is. Here we go. Uh, so, thank you for an interesting talk. Usually, higher order dispersion coefficient is smaller, hence the need for a larger bandwidth to get the dispersion. Can you comment on this? Yes. Um, uh, let me, yes, but Alexander, that is what happens when you have light propagating through some kind of waveguide, right? Remember this device that we have in our laser, you can dial in, program in any dispersion you want. So if the, if the six order dispersion needs to be large, well, you can program it in to be large. So we are not limited by the standard limitations. We can do anything we want subject to the performance limitations of this device. Um, if the dispersion vary, sorry, if the, the phase varies too rapidly, then you get aliasing and all kinds of stuff. But for the things that we have done, uh, it all works. And in fact, some of the experimental results that I haven't shown, we include, believe it or not, um, 18th order dispersion, and it all is in an in a bandwidth of all within six, seven, eight nanometers around fifteen fifty. So, in a in a more general sense, perhaps is we have all been thinking about dispersion as this kind of fixed quantity with rules of thumb that they become smaller, as you point out. And I think this is the first time that you can now really play with dispersion in any way you want. And that is really quite interesting and quite, well, it, allow, it, 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 it is really opens a new dimension to what you can do. The next question of Alex, Tom, if I may, yeah. the, the use of this soliton, well, The paper that is currently under review, we claim that these solitons, well, sorry, let me, let me start somewhere else. I have worked in nonlinear optics on and off for about 30 or 40 years. And one of the eternal battles in nonlinear optics is to increase, is, is, is the fact that the nonlinear properties of materials are very, are very small. So, Half of what you do is trying to get the nonlinear effects 
larger. And so people use these very narrow wave guides and that's where plasmonic is coming in, where you can confine light to less than a wavelength. People have looked at slow light where you really confine the light. So you confine the light in a longitudinal direction, get higher peak values. This we claim is a yet another way of increasing the effective nonlinearity in off optical systems. Um, um, and in fact, what we have measured is that when we have these five frequency components, the effective nonlinearity goes up by a factor of three and a half. Now you may say that's not a lot, um, but if you look at the first slow light experiments, their enhancement was a factor four. So once you have done the first step, you can do lots of other steps as well. Great, thank you, Martin. Uh, I don't see any other questions coming through. Um, and given the time, we might move on. So let's thank okay. Martin again for an excellent talk. Thank you. Okay.